to spell out the importance of villains at this point. Nearly every piece of media needs some kind of antagonist to hinder the protagonist's goal. Usually some of the more iconic ones are the evildoers who never truly stay down, remain a looming presence over the narrative, or just get too much of a kick tormenting the hero to call it quits. And then there are the one-shot villains. They only have one part of a long-lasting franchise, and yet they make the most of what little time they're given, either with how memorable their personalities are, how much damage they've caused, or how much of an impact they've left on the hero's lives. But because a list like this isn't nearly as fun on my own, hit it! Welcome to Josh Scorcher's Countdowns, also a video voyage of all things villain. I'm Fafo's Minion, your alliterating overlord, and I'm super glad that Josh invited me to do this countdown with him. I mean, I myself am no stranger when it comes to villains, and literally everyone else was busy. I'll still take it. So, one-shot villains. What are the requirements? Well, for one thing, they have to be part of a franchise. Admittedly, it's difficult to find good one-shot villains because if they're memorable or well-received, it's very likely they'll make more appearances. Second, they only appear in one game in the story as a villain. If they appear in a later game as a playable character or a hero, they still qualify for this list. Usually there's a reason they don't appear as a villain again, either they were defeated by death, containment, or redemption. We're also taking into account how well they resonate with fans, and gonna give more points to older villains since they were so memorable and stood the test of time. Also, alternate continuities count as separate games in a franchise, so Sun and Moon and Ultra Sun Ultra Moon. For that mind, let's start One-Shot Villains Unmasked. We're not calling it that. The hell we aren't. Fire Emblem has a lot of great villains in its lineup. Given it's an anthology series where every story is different, a lot of the villains in the series would have made for a good candidate on this list. That said, Awakening is pretty weak when it comes to antagonists. It seems like most of them are either gross stuck up a-holes or were not fully realized in the main story. It's saying something when the mooks are far more interesting than the big bads you're supposed to fear. For all the Machiavellian, flatter than Cordelia self-esteem, we got a few relatively minor but still amusing antagonists to salvage from the thicket. One of which is Plegia's honorable General Mustafa. Mustafa can best be described as a father to his men figure. Wait a minute, his name is close to Mufasa, was that on purpose? Anyways, he's an upstanding general who initially fought by Gangrel's army to protect his wife and son from being killed. After witnessing Emran's death, however, he was moved by her speech and thought about sparing Krom's army as he believed in their goodwill, insisting that they surrender to not entice more conflict. Of course, that simply won't come to pass as the two sides continue to fight to the death on the battlefield. If I could make a comparison, the dude's kinda like Guzma. His soldiers respect and continue to follow him for a good reason. He's a role model to them, and when they don't want to fight out of moral quandaries, he permits them to retreat while he bites the axe for them. Even after you beat him, all he wants left is for his men to be spared. Man, the guy's only around for one chapter and he's already the best character in the game. Pathos is a powerful mistress. Veterans of Fire Emblem should be familiar enough with the Camus archetype. There's always that one guy in the enemy army that you don't want to kill because they're nicer than your average bad guy. The difference here is that while these types of characters usually didn't forgive the protagonists or accept their mercy, here it's Krom who's not putting up with Mustafa for siding with the man who got his sister killed. It works because you're not being held at gunpoint to feel bad for him. He may have a good personal reason to keep fighting, but the damage has already been done to the point where neither side could break even anymore. Dirty deeds were done dirt cheap, and penance must be served if it's a good man at the helm. While not the most complex or original villain in the series, Mustafa sticks out really well as a respectable soldier who cherishes the humanity of his comrades and his enemies. It's especially refreshing given how much of a huge <gasps> Lord Awakening's other villains are. Had these people been thriving in better times, they could have been allies, maybe even friends. But alas, Mercy is a diamond in the rough on the battlefield. War sucks. Back to Waifu Simulator. Oh no. I know that look. It was all over your face for a whole month a while back. 
Does the trauma of the blue rodent still lie deep within you, Josh? No! Yes. Okay, yeah, we're talking about Sonic again. Don't worry, it won't be anything too repetitive, just talking about Marlena again. For the upteenth time this decade, and we're only in year two of it. For some reason, you seem to have a particular fondness for the pink-haired sorceress. Is it because her hair looks like braided cotton candy? No, I just find it funny how out of place she is. When we start Black Knight, we see Sonic called down from the heavens with two chili dogs of all things. He likes chili dogs like I like metaphors. With Merlina being the one doing the summoning, we thought she would have been the Shara of this game. You know, the other pink-haired magical girl that isekai'd you into an English major's bedtime story. But no! She's actually evil and wants to make the entire world into an eternal nightmare to stop the story from ending. Yeah, spoiler. The King Arthur that was chasing her was actually her grandfather's creation, and she summoned Sonic to kill him so she could steal Excalibur's scabbard and have the world's time just... stop. What is this heavy existentialism doing in my Disney furry platformer? I thought we were getting rodents at the Renaissance Fair, not slam poetry at a mid-2000s Brooklyn tea shop. Honestly, that's all there really is to say. Her fear of her world ending caused her to go mad and want for it to all stay the same. When she was defeated by Sonic, he consoled her by telling her to live every moment to its best before the end. Yeah. That's Sonic saying that. What is this game? Her nihilism is such a huge contrast compared to the morality of someone simple like Sonic the Hedgehog. The speedy, cannibalistic furry you definitely want safe search on when looking up Sonic adult themes. The last time Sonic did a more adult message was Sonic 06, and yeah, I know you guys are sick of me bringing that one up, so I'll just say at least Merlina is less punchable than Elise. Also, did it take this long for us to get a female villain in Sonic? Yeah. Are there any others? There's Xena and the Deadly Pouring Six. Also Rouge and Wave the Swallow if you count anti-heroes. Right. Wow, well, I'm glad we have Merlina then. Resident Evil's great at keeping memories of their monsters stapled to our brains, typically via freaky fleshy biomutant teeth. But after seven main games, one wacky intern suggests a way to jam them down Harder. He's now the CEO. Why did I let you write this part? Cause you're a genius. You're gonna get me demonetized! Nah, that'd be her. Who let it go? Whoa. Mama. What you guys looking at? Nothing, dear! Josh is looking at vampire boobs. You were. Well, well, after years and years of nasty creeps stalking and trying to eat us, role reversal was sure to come. Village is already memorable on the merits of just being a great game, but it was tall, dark, and meh over here that brought it to the stratosphere. Lady Domitresque poses over eight feet tall as the franchise's latest invincible fiend and the iconic spirit of Mr. X and Nemesis. You being as tall as an elephant with Photoshop Freddy Krueger claws gets you that position. You'd have to be thicker than her to say next. Serving as Mother Miranda's favorite child and first attacker on Ethan Winters, Madam Mommy tries to dom you with her massive gothic mansion. Despite that, she's actually one of the easier Giga Stalkers in the series. Probably because, for the first time ever, there's a personality and ego to get in the way. And yeah, I'm a personality man myself, but I draw the line at Cronenberg Dragon. God damn! Are we still in necrophiliac territory or have we crossed into the Scaly Kingdom? Though her in-game significance is almost nothing to her reputation, the wild design and solid charisma earn her a nod. It's a stylish take on one of their biggest cliches. I dig the battle too. I don't dig her though. Oh good, I'm not the only one. Don't get us wrong, the idea behind her is kinda hot. We like tall women and can ignore the whole murdering thing sometimes, but that fawful smile is a nope. Now you're gonna be thinking of me every time. I'm glad I'm a married man. If you ever need a break from the humdrum of everyday life, come and drop to the Rook Islands, a tropical paradise where you can do anything, including getting kidnapped and tortured by pirates and their unhinged leader. Hey, at least you have a vacation story to tell. 
if you ever make it home alive. Which leads us to our next villain, Voss Monte. Hold it. We can't use that part of his name. Why not? Algorithm. Shit. Technically, Hoyt Volker and Citra are the actual main villains of Far Cry 3. They're both either incredibly sketchy or scummy, and yet they're apparently worse than Voss. So they're making this argument. Compared to me? Heather's a saint. It's a pretty bold statement to make because Vass is, well, to put it nicely, a complete psycho. He's sadistic, has violent mood swings, and yet he has a bit of a charisma. Sure, his men are afraid of him, but he doesn't do anything beyond yelling at him. He even sticks on a few jokes. Run, Forrest! Run! And even tries to connect to the player on the same level and even gives you a chance to escape. You know, before he tries to kill you and all your friends. Hey, you can't say he's an inconsiderate sociopath. The funny thing is that Voss doesn't even have that much screen time in Far Cry 3. We see him for a total of, what, 11 minutes in a 20 hour game? And yet we've heard so many stories about him and seen the destruction he's left in his wake. He builds up a horrifying reputation and then when you meet him for real, yeah. He's lived up to all that hype. And how does he live up to the hype outside of the game? Well, you know that iconic speech of his? Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? They pushed it in all the friggin' marketing because it holds weight. And it's actually kind of true. And the kicker, Voss wasn't always like this. He only lost his mind after Hoyt and Citra, his so-called sister, got a hold of him and made him into this cold-blooded killer. His Far Cry 6 DLC story, appropriately titled Voss Insanity, gives us a little taste of the world through Voss's eyes and his upbringing into the psycho he is today. And yeah, it kind of makes a clear picture. I'm and yet that's what makes him such a compelling villain. His time is brief, but he makes it all worth it. He commits atrocities, but he's too warped to stop. He's sadistic, yet charismatic. And when he talks, people listen. He's arguably the most well-rounded baddie in the franchise. And it makes having to kill him kinda sad. If he's actually dead. Gotta love them ambiguous cliffhangers. In a series like Metroid, where every game has Josh's outro, the opportunity is wide open for a lot of new come and go goons in each and every installment. Is that why it takes forever for new games? I thought you had the slow uploads. Don't push it. Already did. No, Metroid defies expectations all the time, but never this one. Always cloning the same couple of bad guys over and over in some form or another. Ridley's dead! No, he's not. Metroids are gone! No, they're not. Dark Samus retired! She probably did. Crap. But come 2021's Dread, back from the dead, in what may be the new best game in the series. <laughs> yeah, no, that ain't, that ain't Ridley. The 100% completion reward in Samus Returns did a banger job building Dread. <laughs> for what we always wanted but never expected to actually happen, an evil Chozo. These avian aliens were like the Jedi in how universally noble, revered, and proper their image was drawn for the longest time. So when one went bad, it went really freaking bad. The infamous chieftain of the Machin tribe, Ravenbeak, refused to steer his kind from the founding form of the Chozo, uncompromising warlords. Proudly donating his militant DNA for infusion into Samus upon her adoption by the much more peaceful Thoa tribe. Yes, Samus's surrogate father. You are the father. <laughs> Wait, no, they didn't actually just do Black Doom correctly, did they? Oh, yes, they did. At least they didn't kill a little girl. Nah, just her parents. <laughs> 
in just one amazing performance. This Twitter on legs superseded even Ridley in calculative menace, masterfully manipulating and or slaughtering everyone in Samus's life with terrifying efficiency in his ceaseless pursuit to rule the universe. What makes Ravenbeak truly intense is his latest obsession with turning Samus, his daughter by his own words, into the ultimate monster, Chozo Human Metroid, together in power. He made the Samus's Metroid meme canon. Time to uninstall Twitter. Hey kiddos, you want a large ham with a slice of troll extra fried with all this awesome? Hades? Hades. Thought it was Pyron that said that quote. Don't ruin this for me. Yeah, it shouldn't be surprising that the god of trolls himself would make this list. If there was anything that you took away from Kid Icarus Uprising, it was the true overlord of the underworld, Hades. Sakurai Swanson to the flightless angel left many tastes in people's mouths. One of Medusa, one of Reedy, but most of all, the taste of true overarching power that has never been seen before or since in Nintendo's long history of fabled villains. Aren't you the minion of a Nintendo troll villain? Details. Even though I am subservient to the one true chortle, it's hard to not be amazed by the supreme villain charisma on display. Seriously, even if you don't know anything about him, it's just kinda hard considering how much we and a former Autark shove him down people's throats. Just by listening to some of the things he says will make you into one of his servants faster than you will die on 9.0 difficulty. Sorry, Sorry to keep you, you waiting. But now that I'm here, let's, let's get, get this, this party, party started. started. Welcome, Welcome to, to my underworld, underworld. Pretty, pretty Pat. Pat. You too, Pretty Palatate. You see this poor child? Both of her parents are dead. Oh. There was an unfortunate accident, if you know what I mean. You mean you murdered them? It was a simple case of distracted chariot driving. I shouldn't have been doing that here. You'd think the Lord of the Underworld would be too busy for mischief making. Oh no! Making mischief is one of my principal responsibilities. Hey look! An exotank! Hey look! Who cares? When freaky aliens give you lemons, make freaky alien lemonade. Like this! Well, that's one way to do it. That was awesome. Seriously, halfway through the game you even get the feeling of rooting for this guy. That is how good his charisma and charm are. Of course, it doesn't deter from the fact that he is willing to kill minions to fuel his underworld army, even manipulating Palutena and Faridi to do his dirty work without even trying. He's less like a Greek Satan and more of a Greek Osiris, tasked with the guidance of souls to their overall end. I don't know, did you see the look of those orns? They look pretty Satan-y to me. Still, throughout this game, you know he is the main villain, but he tends to help you as much as he screws you over. You can never know what he's thinking. Even with his death, he will still get the last word in. Not even one of the greatest final battles in gaming could truly end the red and blue oni that is his soul. Farewell, sweet god. We hope you don't actually come back, so the legacy of your presence can forever be enshrined in the 3DS's memory. Oh yeah, baby! Let's go! I see those footage files. Enlisted help from the top professional in Mario RPG appreciation to spotlight its king. He has fury! He has victory! He has been talked about to death by you alone! But he brought us mustard of our doom! Three times! <laughs> There's gotta be another good pick around here. Hmm. Eeny meeny miny. Yes. Well, that narrows it down. You'd understandably assume the Mario series hates one-shot villains, with its biggest bad Bowser being the single most overused antagonist ever. Seriously. But when they entered role-playing, yeah, the role was well played with. 
all but two of the franchise's nine true RPGs renovated the Koopa King's throne into one of the finest rogues gallery in all Nintendo. Oddly, all with only one game contracts. Except Popple. I heard you. And Popple. List now. The Mario RPG villains collectively operate the Baskin Robins of evil. 31 flavors of mischief and malice, with Cacletta and Grotus's classic megalomania, alongside Count Black's tragedy charged misanthropy. Every depth is fearlessly measured. And through the parted curtains of vengeful thespians, Dementio and Antasma, a 10 out of 10 show of Elysian illusions awaits your applause. And just in case you need more depraved demon monsters in your life, the inhumanely horrific Shadow Queen and Shroobs will be happy to take yours. Hell, even the more on-brand editions of Dupless and Smithy offer up fights with twists and imagery you could never forget. There's something high quality here for everyone. Truly one of the most impressive aspects of already very impressive games. So which one's your favorite out of curiosity? Definitely Antasma. His vivid design and unbelievable battle dominate my dreams. You? Oh, easily the shrooms, dude. Here they are on the preschool playground screaming, I will kill my own people to destroy you at babies. Too scary even for a remake. <sighs> shall we grieve in silence? We shall. One of the easiest ways to blow up a bad guy in the figurative sense, is to play God with contrast. So many of the greats became great for their rich polarity against their own developments and the hero. Freedom versus security, from janitor to the everlasting king, a strong before and after can power a story for years. Case in point, Undertale. Now, no astute RPG veterans, the glowy-eyed skeleton isn't the monster, the flower is. <laughs> Anymore. There's always an awkward gamble in making something normally pleasant and harmless gruesomely destructive. The bandwagon's as cramped as Tokyo and it's abused more for the gimmick than the potential. Toby hit jackpot with Flowey. Grown in Bill Cipher brand potting soil, this psychotic sunflower is rooted in every overarching theme of this game's powerful story. Just from this whacked weed's introduction, he makes himself memorable. Straight up toehoeing you with Pac-Man dots, aka bullets, aka friendliness pellets, aka bullets. It's called, uh, Count the Bullets. Later on, the master theme of who's the real monster ties your heart in knots when it's revealed he's the soulless reincarnation of Asriel Dreamer, the lost child of the deeply humane Toriel and monster king Asgore. Following the first fall on human's fatal sickness, Azrael was blamed and killed for the death, sparking the war and prejudice between humans and monsters. Though the memories remained, Azrael and his adopted siblings conjoined souls scattered, thus, Killer Demon Flower! Referring back to the strength of before and after, to go from baby goat to SCP TV, congrats! You played God and scared him away. We all joke about it, but what are you really like when you have no soul? You're bored. You're hateful. Your power with no purpose. Kill or be killed. The message of absolute power corrupts absolutely definitely needs to be hammered in, but my god! We got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. I think we dodged a friendliness pellet there. <laughs> In politics, Pinky, lies are just facts that haven't been repeated enough yet. Yeah, we get it. Not everyone is politically active or interested, which is totally fair. And sometimes you just need a break from it all. But every now and then, politics ends up crossing the streams with video games. This could result in something preachy, one-sided, and obnoxiously on the nose, or... Don't f*** with me, Senator! A cornucopia of star-spangled posts galore. Yep, we're talking about this gold mine of memes again. Senator Armstrong, the final boss and overarching baddie of Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. 
He's a... Uh, <laughs> well, um, he's... Don't dance around it, Josh. He's the living embodiment of this song. America, fuck yeah! Well, that sums him up as... Aesthetically, he's hammy, masculine, and empowered by nanomachine, son! Worst of all, he's the next presidential candidate, but so far, his campaign has resulted in a lot of suffering, mass destruction, and chaos galore. So yeah, you think he's just another souped-up gym junkie who will mold the country into whatever twisted dystopia he wants it to be, but then... I have a dream! What? As soon as Armstrong says, I have a dream, everything about him turns upside down. All of our assumptions are gone. He's not in this game for himself. He's in it for the people. His ultimate end goal was to use war as a business to destroy war as a business. Give the citizens their right to think for themselves and corrupt politicians are ground into pulp. Or as he puts it, only the strong survive. And ultimately, he wants to put the nation's power back where it belongs, in the people's hands. Jesus, how did Metal Gear get this deep into politics, and yet nobody hates it? That's easy. They didn't pick a side. They didn't try to play favorites towards a particular party. No, 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 no. They went after politics itself. More specifically, they went after the jerks who use and abuse it for a profit. But there's no money in peace. No. We must start a war. And they didn't just poke fun at politics, they borderline sliced it in half. Despite being so funny and memeable, Armstrong raised a lot of valid points and has an admirable idea. Well, I don't write my own speeches. Uh, could have fooled me. The way he speaks about his philosophy is so engaging. You should hate him, but you don't. The amount of conviction he has just makes you want to not contradict him. But he's still an extremist himself and kind of a hypocrite, so yeah, he's still a villain. He's a crazy, murdering psychopath, I could admire that. But he wasn't completely wrong. In a way, he's kind of like Thanos from Marvel. They both noticed a legit problem and they tried to get people to pay attention to it, but we disagree with their solutions. And that's why Senator Armstrong's earned the runner-up spot. Sure, his approach is wrong, but his goal was in the right. And that's why, even when Raiden takes him down, he still keeps Armstrong's goal alive. His fight music is also kick ass! It's energetic, intense, and really highlights how Raiden and Armstrong are more alike than you think. But as for which of them the song is about, well, half the fun is guessing. Eternatus, Pokemon. We finally get a Poison Legendary, and the fight is so good. Andrew Ryan from Bioshock. How many villains take control of the game outside the player's hands? We must be slaves since we did obey. Dahlia Hawthorne, Phoenix Wright. That death stare still gives me nightmares. Ace Attorney's biggest loser, but in the end, won our hearts. Maruki, Persona 5 Royale. An outcast among Persona villains being both sympathetic and likable. To pass fight is pretty boring for the most part. Luca Blight, Suikoden 2. Why does it take a literal army just to kill this one man? <laughs> Memory is time given life. A fathomable form in which your very own takes shape. Bad. Good. All is you. But should your memories, life, and time left alive come under the rule of one without any rules, could you even fathom the last shape you'll ever remember seeing? Jeez, man! What demon possess you? That checks out. <laughs> this video's final fate was sealed before it even began. It had to be terrible. The despotic god of one and done infamy is Majora. Zelda's scariest monster is a collective nightmare we all remember having. A terror in the night we couldn't perceive, couldn't believe, and couldn't escape. Vanished in a matter of hours, but the hours it stole haunt you to this day. The very design of this living, breathing mask mandate cheats. 
flesh-banging players with blood-curdling chaos in such an erratic, unapologetic rhythm. They second-guess their second guesses, not knowing a lot about something that feels wrong is true horror. Majora is true horror. The one game it starred in could have been as long as the heat death of the universe, and it wouldn't even matter. What it means, what it wants, what it even is, is impossible. Never mind that existential rhetoric aside, this thing makes Ganon look like a comic relief sidekick with an exceedingly disturbing image of a heart snared by spikes and entrails, human dance skills, and a mass mutation of already out of place limbs. And it's scary how little it cares. Majora's plan is so viscerally simple. Moon, smash, bam, nothing more. And that's the amazing part. We'll never know if Majora was intended to be this mecca of speculative evil, or if it's just a rushed, underdeveloped idea that magically conjured a cult of worshippers. But nobody will deny its first and only impression is eternal. I'm Josh Scorcher. And Fuffles Minion. everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for Tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching. <laughs>